Welcome to another Lunch and Learn Hangout session sponsored by AT Still University Information Technology and Services Group. We are coming to you live from Kirksville, Missouri, where it is finally starting to warm up, and we are now at a positive two degrees. Yes, two degrees. We are at Season 2, Episode 10. And that's a good session today. We have with us Dr. Ted Wendell, Senior Vice President for Strategic Initiatives. And also with us, as always, is our very own Gene Varnold, our producer for the Lunch and Learns. And while everyone's kind of getting settled in, let, let's go through a couple of uh, notes about things that uh, ITS is on the brink of introducing uh, to the ATSU community. Um, the first we've talked a little bit about in the past. We've got uh, what we're calling the Break to Educate series. Um, and those will go through Google Hangouts. We're going to start those uh, beginning uh, February 17th, the week of February 17th. I think the official session is uh, on the 28th, if I'm not mistaken. 21st, I think. 21st, it would be the 14th, 21st. That sounds right, Gene. Yeah. Yep. Uh, and so Tammy uh, Whedon-Benner and I will uh, be discussing Google Profiles. So it'll be a good session. Um, and really the goal for that session is uh, for people to be able to walk away um, with an understanding of what you need to set up a Google profile and, and how to set it up. Um, why, why you should have one, why it's important. And, and we're going to keep these kind of quick um, and short and hopefully generate lots of questions. So um, please uh, tune in for that. Um, Second offering we have is really not named yet, but we're looking at community and collaboration tools where people can ask more questions and have answers posted online. So it's really trying to build more of the online ATSU community. Um, and we're really trying to spark interesting conversations um, about IT related things, but others uh, as well. So um, stay tuned as we're still kind of brainstorming that a little bit. Um, but we're going to try and start that conversation with the first break to educate session. Um, and so we'll, we'll probably ask for some naming ideas on that as well. Um, so if you have a suggestion, shoot uh, Gene or myself a, a, a note and we'll get that going. So, all right, I think we're ready to uh, kind of get started with today's Lunch and Learn. Um, we go back to December, and if, if I remember correctly, I think it was over the Christmas holiday. Uh, Ted went to the Philippines um, with Project Hope as a photojournalist. And I, I think maybe the first question is, help us, Dr. Wendell, with why, why, why are we doing this as a Lunch and Learn? Yeah, well, I, I think that's a great question, Brian. Um, it's certainly a little bit different from some of the stuff that we've done in the past, the internal uh, tools that we use and, and the, the things that are directly related to, uh, you know, our everyday job of educating students and helping people. Um, but I recognize that there are a lot of people that have done similar types of projects and, and have undertaken similar uh, trips, and um, it's sort of for the, our institution, something we've done informally, and over the next, you know, year, 18 months, uh, I, I think it's important that the institution begin to formalize the, the types of things we do in, in terms of international outreach and uh, at, at least get an idea of what the opportunities are, maybe some of the pitfalls, uh, some of the, you know, the advantages that, that we might, or s some of the, uh, the positive things we could do. Uh, I, I think it'll become more of an issue within the institution over the next uh, year, year and a half. And I, I, I just wanted to start that dialogue with a little bit about my experience, and it was a unique experience. There are people in um, in our institution have done similar things. I, I first got involved with uh, a group of dental students that were on uh, the U.S. Navy ship Mercy two two and a half years ago now. Uh, so. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not the only one who's done this sort of thing, but uh, this was a different kind of experience, and I wanted to tell people about it and show people. Yeah, uh, I think it, it, it's a good fit with the mission uh, of the institution, and we certainly have a, a large capacity for healthcare education and really healthcare service as well. Um, and you combine those two, and I think the outreach, whether it's international or not international, between students and faculty and lots of ATSU related people, um, the community. Um, who do those kinds of things. So I, I think it makes good sense to, to kind of go through and focus in on one session 
um, and, and tell people a little bit about what it is as an example for what we might be seeing more of in the future. And I think people have, you know, a lot of questions about what's the experience like, uh, what were the good things, what were the bad things, uh, and, and I thought I'd cover some of those today. I, I, we, we set up a screen share here so that I can share some of the images that I captured. Good. Uh, yeah, so that's a good point. Um, as questions come in, please post your questions there in the Q&A session um, on the uh, Google Plus chat. Um, we'll see those. And if you really want to be mean, um, uh, not necessarily a question, but type in where you're coming in from and what the temperature is there. Yeah, that hurts. Yeah. So tell us, Dr. Wendell, a little bit about how you got involved in, in Project Hope. Well, this story starts on Feb or November 2nd. And uh, November 2nd, the Pacific uh, Storm Warning Center saw a set of thunderstorms in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Uh, and by uh, February 7th, that storm had developed into Typhoon Yolanda, uh, probably the largest uh, typhoon uh, ever recorded, uh, in, in at least as long as we've kept records. Uh, and uh, on the morning of November 8th, it slammed into the coast of the Philippines. Uh, it hit the island of Liete, and, and actually the storm surge um, destroyed the, the city of Tacloban. Uh, but that typhoon then continued on, 190 mile an hour winds that raked uh, across the Philippines. The next island that it crossed was the island of Panay, uh, and that is where I went. Um, I got involved because in uh, two years ago, Pacific Partnership 2012, I got to go to the island of Samar in the Philippines, and it, it uh, was just north of Liete, and I was really interested to see if some of the school buildings that we built while we were there in 2012, if those uh, school buildings were still there, were they a shelter when the storm came through. So I started contacting people I know. I, I, I know some of the people at Project Hope. Uh, and um, uh, eventually they asked me to be part of a group of people who went to the island of Panay and the city of Tapaz in the Philippines for three weeks. And um, we left on December 16th, and I was part of a leadership group. You see the slide here. Uh, there were four of us. Uh, two nurses, the two gentlemen in white are nurses, uh, the, the black man in the blue shirt uh, is a public health expert, and we were the leadership team. We went in to, um, to pause on December 16th. We were joined by 14 other people, six physicians, eight nurses, uh, and we were the second rotation to arrive. Uh, we went into Rojas City on the island of Panay. Um, and um, it's important to recognize that this is now, when we, were, when we arrived, it was uh, just over a month after Typhoon Yolanda hit the island. And at this point, most of the streets had been cleared of debris. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to tell you that no one on the island was killed during the, the storm. There were lots of people hurt, but most of the buildings were damaged. Um, and it depends, I'll show you some of the damage here. But this was not an acute response to the storm. This was sort of a, uh, a secondary, once the island had been, um, you know, the, the acute effects of the storm had uh, been taken care of. We were there to help people recover, uh, you know, recover their lives and to help them get set back up. So uh, the airport was functional. The control tower was not. So we flew in in an uncontrolled in environment. Uh, this, you can see the airport's partially destroyed. Uh, and then the destruction on the island was evident everywhere. Uh, this is a picture of a schoolhouse. You see the roof is gone. 90% of the uh, buildings in, uh, in the community were, uh, had their roofs, roofs ripped off. Um, this is a pile of rubble from one of the schools where we visited. Um, it, they just created piles of trash and started over in, in a lot of cases. Uh, was it the rainy season there as well? So, you know, with the roofs being off, was that an issue? It, it, it was a, an issue from a number of perspectives. 
Um, it was the rainy season. Most people had some sort of a canvas cover. The United Nations brought in uh, tarps, and most people repaired roofs with, by, by putting up tarps over big holes. Um, most of the potable water comes from rainfall. They capture rain by collecting it off the roof during the rainy season. When the roof goes away, so does clean water. And that was my biggest, one of my biggest problems. Uh, UN brought in uh, water for us in big jugs. They set up a reverse osmos osmosis station. Uh, so in terms of drinking water, we brought that in. The UN brought that in. Uh, but I didn't get a shower for three weeks. The only shower I got came from uh, a, a downspout that was left on the roof of the building I was in. And I went out and stood under the downspout uh, of the roof. Um, all the clean water uh, that people collected off their roofs was, was essentially gone. So that was a big problem. And uh, three weeks without a shower, and especially three weeks without a warm shower, uh, I told a lot of people. I came home on January 8th, and I walked through the front door. I set my bag down on the floor, and I went to the shower, and I stood in the shower until the hot water ran out. And that was, that was the thing that I wanted to do most for probably two and a half weeks. So. Um, a question about the airport. Uh, it looks like it's about the size of the Kirksville Airport. So a, did you fly across ocean, for lack of a better word, in a small, small plane to get to that airport? Was It's a good question. Uh, it is very comparable to the Kirksville Airport. We flew in a fairly decent size uh, 737 that landed at the airport. Uh, it was pretty full of people coming in uh, to, to help. Uh, but, um, you know, it, it, it flew in uncontrolled. It actually, we flew out of Manila, so the control for the airplane came from Manila. Um, there, there was no other traffic. There were no airplanes that I saw other than the plane that I flew in on. Um, and it's, um, it's a city, uh, Roja City is a coastal town. They got hit by the typhoon, a lot of destruction. But the thing was for the, for the cities on the coast, once you clean things up, those people could go back to fishing. And they got their livelihood back very, very quickly. Uh, they went back to fishing, their seafood, that, that was their main industry. So the city of Rojas, although there was a lot of damage, uh, the economy came back. In Tapaz, Tapaz is in the middle of the, the island. And it was a little different there. As the typhoon came through, and remember the typhoon was 190 mile an hour winds for about four and a half hours. Uh, as, as the typhoon came through, uh, obviously you had some destruction, but it took out the banana crop and the rice crop. And, it, you know, the, the rice crop is just now coming back. But it took out people's nutrition. They didn't have anything that they were growing that was still there. Uh, and it took out their source of income. There was no rice to sell. There was no bananas to sell. So as we reached out and did medical outreach, the thing that we saw was starvation. People had very, very poor nutrition. They, were, they didn't have money to buy food. And we spent a lot of time talking about basic nutrition. Okay, um, we have a question from our buddy Randy Danielson. I First know. of all, he wants to taunt us a bit. Mesa, 57 going up to 75 today. And then his question, Dr. Wendell, what personal health preparations occurred before you left the country? i.e. immunizations, pharmaceutical prophylaxis. How was your health during the trip and any post-trip health issues? And then he says, is this too personal? <laughs> yeah. uh, no, it's not too personal, but it's a great question because I think it's something we, we all have to think about. Uh, as I went on Pacific Partnership in 2012, I got a full constellation of immunizations which included the traditional, you know, childhood immunizations. You get a tetanus booster. Uh, I got Japanese encephalitis. 
as an immunization. Uh, and the one that I got that I don't think people thought about much, but I was glad I had was rabies and the, and the immunization for rabies. Uh, I was glad I had that. There are all sorts of opportunities uh, to, to contact rabies in, in this environment, and I'd recommend that as anybody going on a mission like this should have a rabies uh, immunization. I did hep A and hep C. I think they were the two hepatitis vaccinations I got. Um, and then uh, I started taking uh, an anti-malarial uh, about a week before I left. And about a week after I got there, I realized that nobody else was taking this and that they really hadn't seen any malaria in the Philippines on the island where I was for about 35 years. So I became less concerned about that. The thing that concerned me a great deal and everybody was concerned about was dengue fever. Uh, and uh, nobody that I knew got, was bitten by the mosquito that carries it. So we were lucky. But uh, there's no way to protect yourself against it except for, you know, DEET or um, mosquito repellent. But they were the things that I did. Did I have any sequelae afterwards? Um, no, um, nothing bad. I, 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 I didn't get sick during the trip. One or two of the people did. There's a typical GI upset sort of thing uh, that happens. Uh, that happened to a couple of people. I was incredibly... Um, cautious about what I ate and we didn't have access to, you know, it was a long way to McDonald's. Uh, so we were eating food prepared for us by uh, a family that lived next door to where our compound. Uh, the food was, I think, safe, but I ate mostly rice. And if I never see rice again, I, I, I won't be unhappy. Uh, the rice that we had was native rice, so these were people who, you, you go to the store, you buy rice that was, you know, uh, available in the community. Uh, if you were lucky, it didn't have any big rocks in it. Uh, you had to pick out the pebbles. We did have two people that broke their teeth on pebbles in the rice. Um, but, you know, pebbles meant, if I found the pebbles, I was happy. Uh, occasionally you found things that weren't pebbles and you didn't know what they were, but, um, you know, you, it was something where I was very cautious. Uh, occasionally people, when we visited schools, uh, we, people uh, brought us food and I tried not to eat that food because I didn't know where it came from. It frequently consisted of chicken feet, which isn't exactly the most appetizing thing I've ever seen. So, um, it's a picture of Tapaz on, on the screen share there. Uh, it is a community of about 50,000 people, so it's a fairly large community, but it's spread out over a large, large region. Um, there are 50 neighborhoods or barangay, uh, each about 1,000 people. So we had to focus on uh, the, the medical needs of those communities. That's the way we we interacted, we went to the officials that were responsible for the barangay uh, and communicated with them. Um, we did uh, four medical outreaches. We went to four schools. We saw about uh, 1,500 people total in medical outreach clinics that we did. Uh, that doesn't sound like a lot, but we hit some downtime on Christmas, around Christmas. Uh, the day before and Christmas Day, we didn't do very much. And then New Year's is a very big holiday there. So there were three days where we were just locked out of doing anything because everybody was celebrating the holidays. So we just kind of sat around. This is the yard of the compound where we stayed. We were very lucky. We were able to, uh, Project Hope acquired a house that was three bedrooms, two bathrooms, and a kitchen. And in that area, we had about 18 people. Uh, I started out very lucky. I got to sleep under a, a table in one of the indoor rooms for a couple of nights. And then, apparently, because I snore, I got uh, dispatched to a tent outside. So that, that was, um, I lost my privilege because I snored. 
uh, there was a lot of rebuilding going on. Bamboo was being harvested. It was snapped off by the typhoon, so people were harvesting to build houses. This is a picture of a fairly typical home in, in the area. All the bamboo homes were blown down during the typhoon. The cinder block homes lost their roofs. Uh, we were there as part of three groups that went to the Philippines for Project Hope. We were the second group. Uh, we worked with Tapaz Regional Hospital and District Hospital. Uh, it, that's what it looks like. It's a hallway. And off the hallway there are uh, small rooms. Each room had six to eight people in. Uh, there was a berth every day. Uh, the berthing area was uh, a small room, fairly clean. The, the, the crib was a, uh, an old fruit box that they had lined with some blankets, and that's where they put the babies when, once they were born. Um, <clears throat> there was TB. There was active TB in the hospital. I was very careful about being clean and making sure that I tried to stay away from those areas, but there you know, were people wandering around everywhere with active TB. So that's something that you need to be concerned about in those environments. How, how do you even manage that? I mean, if, if you don't have a shower for three weeks, how, how do you maintain that level of cleanliness to kind of avoid TB? Uh, I, I used a lot of the uh, liquid um, antibacterials. Uh, went through well, three big bottles of that. We all, everybody had it. They made uh, Project Hope brought it in for us. Uh, that was the predominant way. Uh, I, I tried wearing a mask for a while. Uh, when you're a photojournalist, a mask puts a barrier in there that you don't want. So I, I didn't, I didn't use a mask for for very long. Uh, and then I was just conscious. Uh, in the hospital, there's an area where the, the TB patients are. Uh, I did try to stay away from that area uh, as much as possible. But, you know, it's just something that I'm, I'm not sure I have a way of managing it. Question for you. It looks like there's a lot of lush greenery. Was the humidity high? <laughs> Yeah, uh, the weather was um, constantly, the, the temperature was between 80 and 95 each day. Now we're talking uh, the, the, the latitude, it's, it's 10 degrees above the equator. So you're, you're fairly close to the equator. Uh, the humidity was routinely above 90%. Had rainstorms almost every afternoon. The rainstorms were sort of a pleasant uh, refresher. Obviously, that's when I got the shower, um, <clears throat> but the humidity was it was sweltering, and it, it it takes its toll. It really is difficult when you can't get out of it. Imagine not having access to air conditioning, and I, you know, I, I was thankful when I got home. It, it's it, you're always conscious of all the advantages you have when you you know you're, you're lucky enough to have been born and raised in this country, but um, when you're in that heat, humidity. Uh, and you, you, there's no way out of it. it it's oppressive. Mm -hmm. um, we were lucky because we started a relationship with the uh, the mayor of Tapaz. You, that's her on the right in this slide. Uh, her family was very supportive. Uh, they had access to a home. Uh, the mayor's sister owned the home. The mayor's sister was in Australia. She was smart enough to get out before the typhoon. Uh, and uh, they made that home available to us, so that became our compound. Uh, the mayor was very supportive. The mayor's sister, the other sister who lived in Tapaz, actually became a, a tremendous friend and, and supporter of Project Hope. It was always nice to have somebody who had language skills. People don't always understand English, and it's different from the big, bigger cities where most people spoke English. Uh, in in on the edge of the jungle, most people don't speak English. A uh, number of patients stand out in my mind. This lady um, is, a, uh, is the principal of one of the schools in Tapaz. She had retired. 
She had uh, late stage breast cancer uh, and was receiving virtually no care. Uh, the, the cancer had done a lot of damage. Uh, as Project Hope went in, we were able to get her some care, uh, mostly alleviate her pain. You know, we, we couldn't change the outcome. I doubt if she is alive at this point. Uh, this picture sort of brings tears to my eyes because um, the gentleman on the left in the picture, Wally, uh, had been to the Vatican a couple of years ago and brought the, the woman a rosary that he had gotten from the Vatican. And, and this is a Catholic country, so uh, that was a very emotional moment for the, the woman to have a rosary that came from the Vatican. And I was lucky enough to be standing there and take pictures and tell people about it. So uh, that picture is a, is a very fond memory. Um, I got to meet the governor of Cadiz. Um, he was a very nice man. He was very happy. Everybody was happy that we were there. They felt that we were contributing something. Uh, I think mostly it was just they were happy to know that somebody beyond the island cared about them. And it wasn't all the stuff that we did, it was just our presence that made a difference. Uh, went shopping a lot. We had to go get our food. Uh, this is a couple of the volunteers that uh, were responsible predominantly to make sure that we got some good food every now and then. Uh, unfortunately, I don't like a lot of the vegetables that were available, so um, I lost some weight. Um, How much is some? I uh, lost about eight pounds, nine pounds. Uh, it, it, it's not the way to diet, but uh, you know, when you, I, I, I truly ate only rice. That was the only thing that I felt comfortable eating. So. Uh, no, that's, that's, that's what I ate. People ask me about security. Um, and I asked before I left, it's the Philippines, how secure is it? Uh, Project Hope said, no, no problem. It, it, it's, it's incredibly secure. Uh, if you remember the first slide, the, the uh, three guys sitting on the bench in the airport, that's the Manila airport. Uh, the next night, um, the governor of one of the islands was shot by a, a rebel um, and killed about 10 yards from the bench that we were sitting on. Um, the Philippines there, there is an area uh, that has some different factions that are um, disagreeing with each other. Uh, Project Hope made sure that we had uh, the Philippine military presence at all times. The military slept on the compound. There was at least uh, four to six uh, uh, Philippine military on the compound at any given time. Any time we went out, we went out with people that had big guns. Uh, and I felt fairly secure for that, from that perspective. But it was really strange. No matter where you went, you had somebody with a gun next to you. And that's uh, that, that's a strange feeling. We never experienced anything other than uh, the, the best feelings from people. Uh, they were very happy. They were very supportive. Uh, occasionally people got aggressive with uh, panhandling. The military took care of that. Um, when we went to do the medical outreach at the schools, uh, we were very well protected. There was at least a platoon of, of, of soldiers there which made me wonder why we needed that protection, but we never saw anything that warranted it. And why when you went to the schools as opposed to when you went to the market or somewhere else? Uh, because they were formal announced um, programs. When we went to the market, it was informal. Uh, so nobody knew where we were going. Uh, you know, we don't blend in. A, a, a tall white person doesn't blend in well anywhere. Uh, on the Philippines, but uh, in the market, um, we could sort of go in, get out, and, and didn't have to worry about it. The schools were formal announced events where they knew we would there would be a lot of people, and uh, it, it was the New People's Army uh, on that island that uh, are the dissident group, 
and there was a truce up until Christmas Day. After Christmas Day, there was no more truce. So, uh, you know, I, I just think it was a matter of wanting to protect a large group of people that in, in a formal event. Yeah. We did a lot of medical outreach. We, we did the four, pro, four different uh, medical outreach at different schools around the place. We, uh, this is actually Christmas Eve, and uh, there was a party for uh, the disabled individuals in the community, and I was astounded by uh, the fact that there were probably 350 to 400 disabled individuals that came with their families. There were 1,000 people in the community center. Uh, and we were really thrilled to be there. Uh, we, we didn't do a lot other than participate in uh, what would be Christmas festivities, and we gave out rice. We gave out, wow, a couple tons of rice to people, and I imagine it extended beyond the families of the disabled individuals, but uh, there were a lot of people there on Christmas Eve. How I spent my Christmas Eve. Our Christmas was kind of subdued. Uh, we, we prepared a meal, um, and we, we had um, a, a special dessert, hala hala dessert. Those of you from the Philippines might recognize that. But um, we just kind of sat around. Um, it made me a little sad. I wasn't with my family. Uh, I, I got to spend it with some people um, that I enjoyed being with, but it was. It's the time when I felt furthest away from all the people that I, you know, know and love. Uh, um, something. Before we move on, uh, we were speaking of the military. Sarah Spencer made note that her cousin was a Green Beret, killed in the Philippines by an IED while while building a school. Yeah, there. I I, I think those are unfortunate incidents where you know. People try to make a statement by, you know, killing people who are there to try to help. Most of the violence occurs in the southern portion of the Philippines, Mindanao. Uh, they, that's where active terrorism goes on uh, quite frequently. We were a little bit north of that area, but I think um, anybody going to the area and thinking that it's absolutely safe and it's, you know, a vacation mecca or something like that, needs to understand that it's not, you know, it, it, it's not the United States. It's a different type of environment and there are people there that, you know, might want to make a statement somehow. And I'm sorry, Sarah, about um, your brother. That's, that's unfortunate. Every now and then, it, it, I was there as a photojournalist, you get the opportunity to take a picture uh, I've, I've had two people demand to have their picture taken, one in Vietnam when I was on uh, the 2012 trip, and that turned out to be a great picture. This woman demanded that I take her picture. I'm glad I did. She was four foot, seven inches tall, and she was just full of vinegar and vim, and uh, it was, you know, it just turned out to be a good picture, so I'm glad I took it, and I wanted to show it to somebody. Uh, we worked at schools. This is one of the schools. It was in San Nicolas. We had about um, 500 people show up for that medical outreach. We didn't do a lot. I mean, we saw 500 people. We did histories and physicals. Uh, we, we had some drugs to give out. But um, to be really honest, uh, the things that you can do acutely are take care of some, you know, otitis media, some infections. Uh, but you really you're not there to take care of diabetes or hypertension. They have to be taken care of using local resources. Um, the, the story that I didn't get to tell with Project Hope was that we did 150 circumcisions. And uh, you know, I, I had trouble writing that story. Uh, the images were not images that I, I felt I could publish. But um, there, it was really a very valid uh, use of the time and resources. In the Philippines, between when a young man is 10 to 12 years of age, it's a rite of passage. They get they get circumcised. Uh, usually, that involves a um, uh, the most senior member of the family chewing a banana leaf, 
spitting the banana leaf on, on, on someone's penis. Uh, that's antibacterial in their, um, the way they think about it. Uh, then the circumcision's done, and then the, the young man is sent down to the river to swim in the river, and that's the way they manage the pain. So uh, the uh, local health officials have taken on circumcision as a pro project, and we assisted in that project. We did about 150 circumcisions while we were there. We did them in a clean, sterile environment. We made sure the young men had uh, analgesic medication to, to handle the pain. Uh, at least for a couple of days following the, the, the surgery. Um, and I had trouble writing that. I had trouble describing it now, but uh, that was a lot of what we did, and it was really appreciated. Oops, hit the wrong buttons here. Uh, that's, that's just what a school looks like. That's a pretty common look. You can see on the left the building just at the top left-hand part of the frame uh, there's no roof on that part of the building. It was gone. Uh, it was a beautiful community, a new chapel. We went, took care of people, had a pharmacy, um, had pain relief medication predominantly. We had vitamins, and then we had some antibiotics, and I, I doubt that they did very much. Uh, this is outside of a, um, an office we set up. You can see the sign in the background. That's supposed to say Dr. Adults. And uh, a, a seven-year-old Philippine boy pointed out that we had misspelled adults on the sign. So it was kind of embarrassing. My job, uh, I had three jobs. I uh, wrote stories and took pictures. I published about 10 stories. I got a couple hundred pictures. Uh, we used those. Uh, we had a, a CNN. Um, good morning from uh, Tapaz. We had one of those on New Year's Day. Uh, the other thing I did was organize the pharmacy. Uh, a lot of people dumped drugs on us. Um, the UN dumped drugs, Doctors Without Borders uh, dumped drugs on us. So I had to organize what we had and put them into some format that could be used by the physicians. So that was part of my responsibility. We had a formulary that I developed uh, to help people use the drugs. And then the third thing I did was recommend um, future projects for Project Hope. And we recommended that they do a nutrition project. We recommended we, that they do a sanitation project around um, tuberculosis, isolation, and a couple of other things. Now, now, were these projects for Project Hope specifically for this community? Yes. Uh, this was specifically for the community of Tapaz. Uh, project Hope is committed to being there <laughs> Excuse me. For the next year, they've received funds from uh, a variety of sources, uh, several million dollars, uh, in response to Typhoon Yolanda, and they're committed to using that money to help the community. And logistically, are there people always coming in and out, or is three weeks kind of an average stay, or how, how does it work logistically? We did uh, four rotations of 18 people for three weeks. And now they've just converted into longer term, smaller groups. So there are four people there that will stay for probably two months. The project that we wrote up uh, that will probably be adopted will fund a Project Hope Scholar to do, go in and do uh, nutrition, uh, nutrition evaluation and then nutritional supplementation in a variety of the barangay. Uh, so that, that individual. Uh, we'll stay there nine months to a year. Uh, pretty traditional pictures. Uh, these were the boys. They were sitting there waiting for to be circumcised. So we played football with them uh, and just had fun with them. Um, lots of children. It was a great experience. The children were fun. We played with the children. We took care of them. We made sure they had vitamins predominantly. Uh, there was a little beauty. Flowers were incredible. Uh, they were blooming while we were there. Uh, New Year's Day was a big celebration. Uh, there was a roasted pig, there was, and, and I did eat the, the roasted pig. That was really very good. Uh, I, you know, lots of singing. Uh, karaoke is big in the Philippines, and 
people actually rent karaoke machines and they started singing at six o'clock in the morning and didn't stop until well after midnight. <coughs> this is a picture of, uh, that I pulled out of a video that we did for CNN. So we got that on, on CNN on Thanksgiving morning here in the United States. Um, we did do a New Year's celebration. It involved one bottle of champagne shared among 19, 18 people. Did, did the stories, Ted, were there other outlets or was it primarily a, an agreement with CNN or where did, where did your work actually get published or where, where does it exist? Well, Project Hope funded me, so they published the stories on their website. They distributed to a, a number of media channels. Uh, I was there with um, about two-thirds of the people were from Massachusetts General Hospital. The physicians and nurses were from Massachusetts General Hospital. So I know that a couple of stories wound up in uh, uh, the newsletter for Massachusetts General Hospital. Uh, I don't know everywhere that Project Hope distributed stories. I've seen bits and pieces of things. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry. Bits and pieces of things uh, in, in a variety of, of media. Um, I don't know where they got published, to be honest with you. I wrote stories about uh, each of the volunteers so that they could use them in their hometown newspapers. Um, and then we did the, the bigger stories. Um, and I, you know, uh, we did a big thank you story for United Health. United Health had given a substantial donation, so we did a large thank you story for them. Um, we got a satellite phone. And in the days uh, of cellular communication, even uh, all over the world, the satellite phone um, didn't get a lot of use, but um, uh, Motorola donated a satellite phone, donated minutes on the satellite so that we have this, uh, and virtually nobody used the satellite phone, but I had to do a story about how we used the satellite phone uh, so that we could thank the people at Motorola for, for their donation. It was nice to have a satellite phone. There were times when we didn't have cell signal. It was a nice security blanket, but um, you know we had cell signal occasionally enough so that we didn't need it. And then did you do video as well as still photography? I did a little video. Uh, you, you almost have to. Um, it, it, it's hard to capture the stories. Um, Project Hope wanted video for their website, so we did several. We did two or three one-minute videos. So I learned how to do uh, pretty on-the-fly video with a, a, a single-lens reflex camera. Uh, people in the Philippines just love dried fish. And, and this is at one of the markets. Uh, I, I really like this image. It's, uh, I, I've done a series of images about hands doing different things. Uh, but this is a merchant selling dried fish. Uh, that is the smelliest place I've ever been to. They had dried fish and uh, ground up shrimp. And those two things together, uh, you just walk quickly through that part of the market. Main transportation is uh, Carabao or water buffalo. Uh, that's, where, that's the way people get around in a lot of cases. Everybody's got one. They're work animals. Uh, and you see them all the time. Told you about Rojas. Uh, they went back to fishing fairly early after the typhoon. This group of fishermen, we watched them pull in the nets. They, you know, they get a lot of fish. And then the, the local rice stores, uh, that's, that's what I ate. Uh, any questions, anything? I ran through a lot of material. We don't have any right now. Okay. All right. Um, Ted, can I, what, what were some of your overall impressions from, you know, from the session? Um, you know, overall, I think it was really nice to be there. People appreciated the fact that there was, a, there was somebody there who cared. Uh, there were, in Tapaz, there had never been a, uh, a relief agency go into Tapaz in anybody's memory. So, they were very, very thankful. Every place we went, people were, were very thankful that we were there, came up and, and, and thanked us spontaneously. 
and then I think about the, the manpower and the money, and I, I, I'm not sure that we accomplished a lot. You can't do anything from a medical point of view other than treat some, uh, treat in, uh, some acute infections, uh, deal with nutrition. Uh, once we leave, the people who had real problems, the diabetes, the blood pressure problems, uh, the more uh, significant disease problems had to go back into a system that really couldn't handle them before the typhoon. So if you know, it, it, you know we weren't able to do a lot for those people. Um, I think the real overall impression was that you know, we we did some good. We cared for some people. We showed people that there were people around the world that cared for them, and that, that was that was important. From a technology standpoint, I mean, you know, I know you well enough to know you're kind of a geek. What, what were your impressions from from how technology is used, how it could make an impact in healthcare or more generally in life? The thing that's obvious is that there's access to um, the internet almost everywhere. I mean, I was out on the edge of the jungle in a hospital that had very little in the way of sophisticated medical equipment, but they had access to the internet. And there's a you know, there's a way for us to interact through the internet to train people, to educate people. And I think that's that's the the thing that I came away with. We don't have to rely on sending people there. We don't have to you know worry even about language. Uh, problems, we can put things on the internet that can be consumed in the most distant outreaches of, of the world. So I think uh, I was impressed by the bandwidth that was available in these communities that were out on the edge. Uh, every, every, even, the, even the most challenged of neighborhoods had access to cell signal and had access to digital TV. And culturally, you know, just because we can post something, that doesn't mean it would be consumed or necessarily be helpful. I mean, do you feel like there's a, a cultural awareness and willingness or kind of where are they at on the learning curve? There is a, what I saw was a tremendous hunger uh, among the health professionals for access to that kind of material. Uh, people, we did a number... If, if we weren't doing medical outreach, we were in the hospital doing some sort of training. Uh, and, you know, those events were widely attended. People stayed and asked questions. You could just see that people wanted the information. Um, and it took us a little while to get dialed in culturally in terms of what was present, what knowledge was present, what knowledge wasn't present. But it didn't take long. We realized people had a basic understanding of drugs. They had a basic understanding of, of sanitation and, and, and disease processes. So we took it from there. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so there, is a, there is a hunger out there, and I think there's a lot that we could do uh, to, to help people. Okay, I have a comment from Robert Bowman. Uh, excuse me if I don't say this correctly, but Mindano has a community engaged medical school that arises locally with training supported by schools in Australia and Canada. Yeah, it's Mindano. Um, you know, and Bob, I'm, I'm not all that aware of that. I did speak with a number of people. Uh, we had two individuals on our team who had, grew up in Mindanao. Their comment to me was that I would be, I would not be safe as a white individual on Mindanao, that I, they would fear for my safety. So, um, you know, I think that's, that's an interesting place. I think if I were doing any planning, I'd, I'd want to stay away from there. That's all I know about Mindanao. And I, I'm just trying to remember, typhoons in the Philippines, is that an uncommon event? If I remember correctly, I don't think that side of the Philippines would normally get a typhoon, would they? They, they do get typhoons. Uh, 
just about the same rate we get hurricanes. They're, okay. they're usually not that dramatic, and, and uh, I, I think I put it in the trailer. Um, they're usually minor in nature. They grade uh, their storm response at four levels. Uh, level one, uh, it's called signal one, is probably uh, up to uh, you know, 75 miles an hour. It's a storm. It's, it's not a major storm. Uh, a signal two is, is a moderate storm, maybe up to 110 mile an hour winds. Um, signal three is, is, a, is a pretty significant storm in, in the Philippines. Uh, Typhoon in Orlando was a signal four. And that really was a problem because as, as things developed in, in early November, um, the day before, November 7th, the government put out a signal four alert. Nobody knew what that meant. The people in the Philippines had never heard of a Signal 4 event. They don't remember a Signal 3 event. Uh, some of the elderly people did remember a Signal 3 event uh, 30 years ago, but nobody had heard of a Signal 4 event, so they didn't know what to expect. And certainly they didn't expect 190 mile an hour sustained winds for four hours. Did you mention earlier that there were no lives lost? No lives lost on Panay. Okay. Uh, there were 6,000 lives lost predominantly in Tacloban. If you look at the geography of Tacloban, they, they, it, it was in the wrong place at the right time. The typhoon came up a channel, pushed a 20-foot wall of water in front of it, and, and slammed it into the town of Tacloban along with the winds. And it was just, you know, that's where most of the lives were lost, was on, on the island of Leyte. Uh, Robert Bowman says that Japan's rural medical school graduates, Jakai, if I'm saying that correctly, 40 class years, also helped respond to tsunami and disaster in Japan, community engaged health professional education. The, on the island of Liete, the people who came to help, the United States came to help. They sent two ships, but uh, they didn't stay long. Uh, and they, and they did a modest amount. Japan did a great deal uh, of relief. Canada did a great deal of relief, and Australia did a great deal of relief. The UN was the predominant controlling agency. Uh, we work with the UN uh, every day. They, they did most of the coordination. And then Doctors Without Borders did an incredible amount of, of uh, relief. But Japan was one of the, the principal relief organizations. I, you know, I want to wind up here with, with just a story, uh, uh, and it, it really had a, a huge impact on me, but the individual that was helping us uh, in Tapaz uh, was a young woman whose husband was killed five years ago uh, when she was five months pregnant, and she had a little, little girl, and her picture was in the presentation earlier. Um, on November 8th, she cowered in the, the, the home where we stayed for four and a half hours. She cowered against uh, a cinder block wall, um, didn't have any idea wh what to expect. Uh, two and a half hours in, the, the skies cleared, she went outside, and suddenly the wind was blowing just as hard from the other direction. Uh, the building flooded, the roof was destroyed. Uh, that was November 8th. Her daughter, who was five years old, um, her birthday was November 11th, and uh, they had a party planned, and uh, the young woman, the mother, uh, got on a motor scooter and drove two and a half hours to Rojas City to buy a cake for her daughter so that she would have a cake on her fifth birthday, and she, so she could have her friends over. Uh, and I, she did it on a motor scooter, and she drove two and a half hours through down trees and down power lines, got the only cake that was available in Rojas City, and then drove back so that her daughter could have a cake on her birthday. And I, you know, that's that's just an amazing, um, amazing uh, person. Right. You know. Go ahead. Go, now, when you see that kind of you know, commitment and dedication, I, you know, I was glad I was there to help. Well, that's what I was going to ask to kind of wrap it up. 
you know, did you feel like you made a difference? Yeah, yeah, I think I did. Uh, not a huge difference. Uh, personally, I think I got to tell a story. I got to tell a story today. I get to tell a story in a, in a variety of other media. Uh, I, I personally feel like you know, it was a really hard trip. Uh, no shower, no electricity, uh, not having a lot to eat. Uh, personally, for me, to know that I can handle that was a big deal to me. I, you know, uh, I, I've never done that sort of thing. The other thing that um, you know, I think I made a difference to the people who were there just because I was there. So. But yeah, it was worth it. I'd do it again. Uh, I'd like to go back to, to Paz and uh, see what see what's come of what we started. Ted, thanks so much. Appreciate it. Good story. Good uh, good information. Um, and I think it fits well for uh, everything that happens here, in, in a small sense and in a big sense at ATSU. So appreciate we it. We have a special thank you from Robert Bowman. He says thanks so much for the presentation and for the reflections. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I think we'll call it there. And uh, please um, tune in uh, in a couple of weeks. February 25th will be our next uh, Lunch and Learn session. And uh, the topic uh, for that session will be online testing. So it'll be a little bit different, but I think it'll be a good one. And then uh, remember the Break to Educate sessions coming up, uh, first one on Google Profile. So stay tuned for that. Thanks. Uh, thanks for joining us. Have a good rest of the day. Thanks, Gene.